As we've been reporting, President Trump's former campaign chairman, Paul Manafort, was sentenced Thursday to less than four years in federal prison for tax and bank fraud. That is far less than the roughly 20 years he had faced under federal sentencing guidelines. The sentence delivered by a federal judge in Alexandria, Virginia, sparked outrage on social media, with some advocates noting that the stark disparities exist in our criminal justice system. Former federal district judge Kevin Sharp is here with an insider's perspective. Kevin Sharp, welcome to the News Hour. We, we talk about sentencing guidelines. What are they? Who sets them? Uh, and do judges have to abide by them? Well, thank you for having me here. The sentencing guidelines came about in the late 1980s um, as, a, as a counter to what was believed to be too much uh, disparity across the country and across jurisdictions on sentencing. And so these guidelines came about. It's, they're formed by a commission, presidential commission, lots of experts in the area, and they will assign uh, a numerical values to, to crimes. And then there are certain enhancements and mitigating factors that would adjust to get you to uh, a range. At one time, those ranges were mandatory, but after the uh, case of United States versus Booker, the Supreme Court said they're not mandatory, but they're advisory. And so they become really the, the basis that every judge should work from to, to fashion a sentence. But a judge is not required to abide by them, is that correct? No, that's right. They're, they're not required, but you are required to determine what the guideline range is and then use that as your starting point when you fashion a sentence. And the sentences are supposed to be sufficient, but not more harsh than necessary to comply with the purposes of of why we sentence people and the goals that we're trying to accomplish. So how far out of the norm was the sentence that was handed down uh, by this federal district judge yesterday in Virginia uh, for Paul Manafort for tax and bank fraud? I, I think, well, one of the things you need to focus on is that the he's only being sentenced for the crimes that he was convicted of. And so you're right, you mentioned those as, as the, the uh, tax fraud. Um, but it was fairly out of the norm, uh, I think. Now, I don't disagree that that guideline range, 20 years, um, is, is awfully high. And in, and in most instances, I think that the guideline ranges are overly harsh. But that's why a judge has discretion, and you can move upward or downward from those ranges. But to come down to something, you know, at, right at four years was... Um, was very odd and very surprising for me, and, and a bit disturbing based on what I know and experienced uh, about the disparity in sentencing between white-collar crimes and drug crimes. Well, we know what, what we were mentioning earlier is there's been an outcry today on social media and beyond that with many people saying uh, that, that individuals who have committed far uh, different crimes uh, where no one, where there was no violence involved, no one was hurt. There was even a, an item uh, by, written, uh, written about by a public defender in New York City saying a man stole $100 worth of coins out of a laundry right. and, was, and was to be sentenced for longer than what Paul Manafort received. Right. Now, I don't, I saw that uh, as well. I'm not sure if that's accurate or not, but, but I know that that general feeling and what they're talking about happens. Uh, you had the individual down in Texas who, who um, voted when she should not have. It appears that it was inadvertent and she gets five years. So there are two things going on. One is, was this sentence appropriate for Mr. Manafort? But then there's the flip side of that is, are these other sentences just entirely too harsh? And, and we need to not lose sight of what we're really talking about, and there are separate issues here. I think that the sentence for Mr. Manafort was, was unjust in the sense that there, there should have been, for the crimes that he committed, um, uh, a more harsh sentence. And I'm, and I'm equally sure that had um, the individual not been wealthy or white, that we probably would have seen that sentence. And not, not because I'm saying anything about Judge Ellis, but I'm saying that's what the data would show. We Sentences sh are just more harsh. Anyway, and we should just point out, uh, Kevin Sharp, that you, in stepping down from the federal bench, what, two years ago, a little over two years ago, right. made a statement about your, uh, the way you read some of the sentencing guidelines, and you felt they were too harsh. Exactly, particularly with regard to nonviolent drug crimes. 
um, there were three individuals that had mandatory, were in my courtroom, uh, convicted of drug crimes. Um, I was required to give them mandatory life sentences. That to me was outrageous and not at all in line with what uh, sentencing should be about, particularly if we're looking for a sentence that's sufficient to punish for the crime that was committed. Um, and, you know, we're, we're not looking at those things. We're, actually, we're finally starting to look at that, but I was very frustrated by what was going on. Um, and thought that there needed to be a better spotlight on that. I think some of the things um, that are happening with the First Step Act are moving us there. There's a, still a lot more that needs to be done. And so in the one sense, I'm arguing sentences right. in general are too harsh, particularly for drug crimes. But individuals are who you sentence, right? So if we look at the individual and what this individual did, I'm back talking about Mr. Manafort, if you're looking at what he did and all the other factors that you take into account for sentencing, um, I think this was entirely too lenient for, for what happened. All of this pointing to the fact that uh, there's been a lot more focus, as you say, on sentencing, and we're going to continue to do that. Kevin Sharp, we thank you very much. Thank you.